welcome back to uh, the channel. So today I want to talk about the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez. Okay, I just watched the uh, Netflix documentary on it. Uh, phenomenal job. Uh, great storytelling. And this one got to me a little bit because it goes against everything that I've been taught and everything that I've been uh, or have experienced in my 20 years of law enforcement and being a detective, especially on serial homicides. So I wanna go down through some things that uh, I thought was important and talk a little bit about the Night Stalker. For you that are new to the channel or don't know me, my name's Ken Maines, uh, law enforcement for 15 years, Marine Corps four years, and did lots of unsolved cases and was on the history channel discovery science channel blah 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 it doesn't matter doesn't just the reason i tell you that stuff is because and sometimes it's funny is i get these comments of people they're like yeah who who cares you know you're just talking about yourself are, are you for real okay the the reason i tell you uh, about my law enforcement and uh, so on and so forth is for a basis, a foundation of what I'm going to talk about. A lot of these uh, YouTubers or videos that I watch, these people have zero experience and they spout off like they're experts and they've never done anything. Now, don't get me wrong. All you need really is a natural curiosity of the unknown in order to effectively work or investigate mysteries and cold cases. I get that. And there's housewives out that are better investigators than me. I guarantee it. Um, but as a foundation, I was in law enforcement uh, almost 20 years. I was on the History Channel's Hunt for the Zodiac Killer, five episodes, uh, where we made great strides, great progress. Been to plenty of schools, uh, have plenty of experience working on cold cases. So when I'm talking about this stuff, you know I'm just not blowing smoke up your ass. And I just rolled out of bed with some Cheetos and you know hit play on a on a video camera to talk. I know what the hell I'm talking about. So that out of the way let's talk about the night stalker and richard ramirez uh one of if not the most brutal evil people that has ever lived i have researched thousands of serial killers he's got to be in the top two or three and he's probably number one of the most evil and also, by going by a criminalistic or criminal profiling standpoint, the most difficult person to catch um, or categorize. That's a better way of putting it. The reason I say that is his MO. This guy molested kids. He raped elderly he killed men and women and children he was a burglar he was a thief he was all over the spectrum is what i'm trying to get at usually there's an mo there's a pattern okay a specific person a serial killer will kill the elderly and that's what he does very rarely did they ever jump off to kids or men if they were killing and raping women. So very difficult to link uh, unsolved cases because he was all over the place. In this instant, he left clues at a lot of places. So you could link them through those, through the clues, because you definitely we're not linking the Night Stalker through MO or signature. It just is not happening because uh, he was all over the place. But let's look at his timeline. He began murdering, according to the documentary, 
around March of 85 until the August of 85. And he was convicted of 13 murders, five attempted murders. Uh, he did not go to a trial for any of the uh, kitty stuff, none of the abductions. Um, but during March of 85 and August 85, that was the focus pretty much of the Netflix documentary. Uh, that timeline is hard for me to understand and grasp. He committed all these murders, at least 13, in that March 85, August 85 time span. However, okay, in 1984, um, he was con not convicted. He was found through DNA technology in 2007. So in 2007, DNA technology being advanced linked him to a 1984 murder of a nine-year-old girl in San Francisco who was raped and hung over a pipe. Very reminiscent, at least to me, of the BTK killer and what he did with the first time that he killed. Uh, he, he hung a boy or maybe it was a girl, Josephine, over a pipe after raping her in the basement. Uh, so did uh, Richard Ramirez know this? You know, you know, he studied serial killers, according to the documentary. So it, it's possible. But what I'm getting at is, so if he committed this crime in uh, 1984, Netflix documentary starts his killing spree of March of 85. You have almost a whole year there that he didn't commit any murders. Nope. Didn't happen. There's unsolved murders out there. Uh, that Richard Ramirez did between when he killed that little girl in 1984 and then March of 85 when they say that he started his first uh, killing spree there in Los Angeles. Uh, brutality of these crimes are horrendous. Okay, you got to understand, he abducted a six-year-old girl from her house. And this is one of several you know, as many as uh, 10 to 14, I believe, where he snuck into somebody's home, took the kid, took him to a place, raped the kid, uh, and then abandoned him. Didn't kill him, but doesn't make it any, any less evil. Okay? So here you have a, a child molester. And this gets to a, another point, a very good point about the Zodiac killing. Arthur Lee Allen was a child molester. He had been convicted of that. And a lot of people dismiss him as a suspect of the Zodiac because they say he's a child molester. That's what his M.O. is. He wouldn't be killing at lover's lanes and stuff like that. Well, Richard Ramirez proves that that point is not always the case. Okay, so you can't dismiss a suspect just based upon an M.O. That's very important to remember. But the brutality of these crimes, okay, he cut somebody's eyeballs out and took them with him, okay? He left his bloody shoe print on a victim's head when he stomped it. He killed by gun, a uh, 22 caliber, and then he switched to a 25 caliber, uh, but a gun, knife, ligature, blunt force, strangulation, manual, I mean, this guy was all over. All he wanted to do was kill. Can you imagine the fear of just living at night and knowing that this is happening in your community? And somebody come into the most sacred place, your home, and to commit murder and to do all this violent stuff to you. And then he would eat. You know, he would take a shower, you know, and he would... Write stuff on the wall reminiscent of Manson. Again, is he studying these past uh, serial killers? Even though technically Manson wasn't a serial killer. Uh, you have uh, something that is in common with the Manson killings, the writing on the wall. You have something in common with the BTK killer. Uh, and that's uh, hanging the girl over a pipe. Um, so, I, I don't know... It, 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 is he a copycat killer? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't claim it that. But according to the documentary, he knew a lot about the Hillside Strangler, who uh, murdered many women in that area of Los Angeles. So there was a lot of uh, similarities. 
the detectives in that series impressed me a lot and their determination uh you know gill was the one where uh no and i related to him you know he would say how he would go in and give his theory on a case and when he left and in his words you know he got wind from uh, one of his friends that was in the room when he would go in and tell these older detectives what his theory was he would leave and they would motherfuck him <laughs> I chuckled when I read that or watched it because I got that all the time you know you're a younger detective you go in you give your theory you say why and you know they listen uh, and then you walk out the room and they're motherfucking you most of the time because they don't have the balls to do it to your face uh, but regardless uh, that happened to him on this case when he started to believe that all these ab child abductions and these murders were linked. Uh, the clues that the Night Stalker left, you know, the he had size 11 and a half, I believe, shoes, and he was leaving shoe prints all over the place. And they were from a, a brand called an Avia, which was pretty rare. And... They didn't want that information released. And I understand why is because you want to hold that back. So that way, if it goes out, the killer's going to get rid of it. Well, he doesn't want to be caught. They know I have these type of shoes. Well, the mayor of San Francisco at the time put out that information. Um, and rightfully so, these detectives were pissed off. That was their biggest clue was these shoes. And if they were able to develop a suspect, do a search warrant on his house, and find a pair of Avia sneakers that match the shoe prints at these crime scenes, you know, you got your killer and you got some good evidence. But the mayor, who obviously has no idea what she was doing, I understand as a citizen Maybe I would want that information released, and maybe that's how she was acting. But my other half of me, law enforcement, you, you can't release that stuff. You can't. Because what did Richard Ramirez do as soon as he heard that press conference? He took those shoes to the Golden Gate Bridge, dropped them off, and they were never recovered. Okay? And that's a fact. That's what Richard Ramirez said that he did as soon as he heard that. He took those shoes and got rid of them. So... One of the other aspects that really threw me off that I want to talk about is those child abductions. A person that does something evil to a child, sexually assault, torture, murder, they are the epitome of evil, okay? Psychopath, sociopath. These guys are evil. But again, I... It just blows my mind that this guy had so many different M.O.s, you know, raping these kids, raping the elderly, killing females, killing males, killing with knives, killing with gun, killing with strangulation. He was all over. So I understand the detective's frustration. Absolutely. Because it went against everything that you were ever taught. And is it because this guy was into Satanism and he just wanted to inflict as much pain as possible on these people? Probably so. Um, but the children, I didn't know that about the Night Stalker. You know, I am fairly educated on serial killers uh, with my research. But I did not know. And the reason I think I didn't know this about the Night Stalkers, they never charged him. Even though a six-year-old victim went and picked him out of a lineup and said, that's the guy, and if you want me to testify so he doesn't hurt any other little girls like he hurt me, I will. Oh, if that doesn't get to you, I don't know what will. Uh, but rightfully so, the prosecution and the detectives didn't want to put her on the stand and relive all the horrible stuff that she would have to go through testifying against him and so it was never publicized and I never knew that about the Night Stalker which I already thought he was pretty evil I mean god damn the, the stuff that he did cutting out people's eyeballs stabbing uh females in the, their vagina and uh 
just horrible. And then you throw on top of that what he did to these kids. Uh, speechless. Just pure evil. Uh, but what made things... There was two things that made it worthwhile for me. And by worthwhile, I mean Richard Ramirez getting what he deserved. Uh, he ultimately was arrested and convicted, as everybody probably knows. And he was uh, sentenced to death. He didn't get there. Uh, like most people that are sentenced to death, they usually die beforehand. He died, I think he was 53 years old, um, in 2013 of cancer. And good for him, you know, one last scumbag uh, to be around. But um, the two things that I enjoyed was the cop that eventually, according to Netflix, got his name. And that was the big break. Okay, they knew him as Rick. Everybody, there was a lot of missed opportunities, but that happens in a lot of investigations. But the one cop says, you know, I had an informant. He came out. He says, I know him and his name's Rick, but I ain't telling you nothing else. This cop basically punched him in the face um, and made him tell him his last name, which was Rick Ramirez. Uh, I like that. I like that, that that cop you know did that that's old school shit and i'm all about old school shit and he said you're not going to tell me and he said he he jabbed them in the face not my best jab he says but good enough and he said is that all you got you know and so i reared back as far as i could and i hit him again and you know eventually he told him his name and that's because he had seen a crime scene he had seen these elderly people you know there was a sometimes you know Drastic measures need to be taken to prevent evil, okay? That's very important to remember. And if it takes smashing somebody in the face to get that, that's what you do. So the second thing I enjoyed is when he was eventually caught. Uh, he had left town. And he was coming back to L.A. And now it's on the front page. They identified the nice stalker as Richard Ramirez. Um he gets there and he sees people looking at him. Then he looks at the newspaper and sees his mugshot on there from a prior arrest. And people are looking at him, pointing. He takes off running, gets on a bus, runs across the freeway. And he's just running and people are chasing him. And he gets to this one Hispanic neighborhood. And these guys beat the shit out of him. They beat him with a metal pipe, one guy, and then these two brothers held him down and, and punched him and didn't let him get up. And that, <laughs> hey, vigilante justice, eh, maybe, you know, you know, there's laws in place for a reason, but that made me smile. I was happy to see that he got a little bit, you know, of what he did to his victims. And if the police wouldn't have showed up, they probably would have beat him to death. And that's what he would have deserved. But that little vigilante justice, I liked it. Um, another thing that, you know, I wrote down a few things like I always do when I watch something like that, that really bothered me was his appearance in court. Sunglasses? And then, unless they were prescribed eyeglasses, he shouldn't have been fucking wearing them. I'd have ripped him off of his face and then stepped on him right in front of him. Come on. You can't allow that. You know, he's a prisoner. Uh, but that was just something that I wrote down that, that bothered me. Another thing that not bothered me, I guess, but these groupies that were sending him nude photographs and stuff. thinking, And one journalist on there said he oozed sex appeal. Are you kidding me? Jim Morrison oozed sex appeal, okay? Elvis ooze sex appeal. Richard Ramirez and his fucked up, gapped, rotted teeth and his little acne face didn't ooze sex appeal. Okay? So why these women are attracted to him is strictly because he was famous. And that's a hell of a way to get famous. You can't do anything else in life to be famous. 
So I'm going to take somebody else's life and become famous that way. And unfortunately, there are people that do that, you know, in life. And uh, it's sad. It's sick. Um, but he became famous that way. And these girls that are sending him pictures and love letters saying, oh, he's such a nice guy. Get the fuck out of here. You're just as bad as he is. Okay? This guy took people's life. The most treasured thing on this earth is life and this guy wrecked so many people's lives by what he did and you're gonna say well he's a nice person he's misunderstood get the fuck out of here you're stupid you're gross and you're just as bad as he is how's that these stupid groupies for serial killers anyhow it's my opinion on that there's more unsolved murders that Richard Ramirez did I have no doubt. Somebody's got to be looking into that, and I'm sure they are. I mean, as in 2007, they, they solved one, you know, of that girl. So my, I wonder if something happened during the murder of that girl in San Francisco, that nine-year-old girl in 1984, that affected Richard Ramirez, that he, because later on, during that, time frame of March of 85 to August of 85, he abducted, let's say, 10 kids. And that, don't hold me to that number, but let's just say 10 children. And he sexually assaulted them all and he let them all live. Why did he deviate? Okay, why he had killed, obviously, a girl earlier, a nine-year-old, hung her from a pipe in 1984. Did something happen? Because the six-year-old girl said, when they interviewed her on Netflix... And she was reluctant to say this, but she said it was almost as if he was sorry for what he was doing. I, I, I'd like to get into Richard Ramirez's mind and find that out. Did he have a, a bad experience murdering that girl in 1984 and he didn't want to do it anymore? Or what was the reasoning? Or maybe there was no reasoning. Uh, maybe he's just all over the place just like his M.O., but it's something that, that I find odd. So, uh, anyways, that's what I think. Netflix, Richard Ramirez, The Night Stalker. I thought it was a great documentary. Kudos to those two detectives, uh, Salernos and uh, Gil. They seem like uh, soul of the earth, dedicated. And I, I, I couldn't hold a candle to those two detectives from what I've seen and everything that they had gone through. So much respect to them. Uh, I think my partner in the Zodiac show, Sal Lar Barbera, knew both of those. So when I talk to Sal, I think I'm going to ask him more about that. He always gives me some good insight on California and LAPD and the sheriff's office out there and the, that old school uh, uh, time frame. So Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, evil, evil, evil person. Uh, unsolved cases out there that he did, absolutely. And I hope somebody's looking into that. Uh, until next time, Maine's out. So today on Redemption from Death Row, we're going to be talking to Bill Nagara about his neighbor. It's a famous neighbor. And who would that be? The Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez one of the most vicious serial killers of all time. He was on the same tier as Richard Ramirez up until when Ramirez died, I believe, in 2013. He knows him, studied him, behavioral, watching him, conversed with him, um, knows his in and outs. I want to know what Richard Ramirez was like. Is he really this god-awful serial killer that everybody feared or is he just the uh you know creation of the media per se i don't know uh he certainly was a serial killer and from what i know one of the most vicious he didn't have an mo and that always bothered me about him it's hard to trace that when you not only kill young women but you also killed old women and you didn't just kill white young men, you killed old black men or Mexican men or you molested children. All of these things Richard Ramirez did. And he killed by knife, he killed by gun, 
He strangled. He bludgeoned. That's an evil man in my book. Okay? Ripping out somebody's eyeballs and putting them on the dresser and the jewelry. I mean, just despicable, horrible things that you could possibly imagine. Bill knows them. Actually, I think Bill told me when he first got there in county prison, he got in a fight with Richard Ramirez or something. I'll have to ask him about that. if I. Rem but I do kind of remember something like that when I first started talking to Bill. Uh, let's see what he has to say about the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez. So stay tuned and let's see what we can hear. Uh, somebody who I considered now and right now probably the evilest serial killer that I know of that I've researched and that is the Night Stalker Richard Ramirez. Now Bill Nagara may have a different opinion on that because Bill has lived or lived with uh, Richard Ramirez for a long time. He studied him. He's talked to him. He knows everything there is about him. He knows stuff that the uh, average person obviously doesn't know and things that I don't know. And I want to learn more about this person who's called the Night Stalker. So, Bill, tell me uh, about your knowledge about Richard Ramirez and the background and how you got to know him. Well, obviously, Richard Ramirez was sentenced to death and sent to San Quentin State Prison. And when he got here, uh, I was here. He lived on the same tier with me, which is the fourth tier of the East Block uh, unit. And he lived a few cells from me. Now, of course, there's a, he is, in my opinion, the greatest media invention that, that ever existed. Because they had this guy as this you know, stalker, killer, intelligent guy who, you know, moved through walls. He was almost a supernatural being. And when I saw him, when I had a chance to study him, none of those things, you know, really struck true to me. Now, he is a killer. There's no doubt. He is an evil person. He is a, a creepy guy. He is not intelligent. He barely writes. Uh, his mannerisms are almost feminine. And that sound it strikes people a little funny, but remember, I know the real Richard Ramirez, not the guy that the media portrayed or that they invented. He loved that name, Night Stalker. In here, in prison, they used to call him Brujo, which is B R U. J O Brujo means witch or warlock. You know, he dressed in black, he walked around, and he really had a different sense of what prison would be like. He thought, and I'm sure that he fed into the media's interpretation of who he was. So he comes to death row and he believes everything's the same. Everybody fears me, everybody's gonna, you know, walk away from me or pay homage to me. He had this twisted sense of what prison's like. So, Ken, let me explain to you that there are inmates in prison and there are convicts in prison. And there is a huge difference between the two. In inmates, it's just a guy who's in prison doing time for whatever reason, it could be horrible reasons, but he doesn't understand the prison culture. The convict is a man who is in his element. He's around criminals, and in this particular environment, he is the apex predator. He is the predator, he is the guy that people fear, he is the person that people respect. Because in prison, your ability to, for that ultimate goal, which is to kill somebody else, is really the only language spoken here. Richard Ramirez didn't speak that language. The first day he went out to yard, he was assaulted viciously. They didn't know he was going out. They weren't prepared for him, but they viciously attacked him, sent him to the hospital. Then he comes back from the hospital, and this is before I really get to know him. I just, he's on a tear. I know what's happened to him. I knew prior to him going out what was going to happen to him. So he gets back, he waits 10 days, he tells the administration he believes it may be a mistake, that they mistakenly attacked him thinking he was somebody else. There's nothing further from the truth. 
he goes out again. This time they're ready and he stabbed him, nearly killing him. So that tells you how people feel about serial killers in prison. What the public doesn't know is that serial killers give criminals a bad name. I know that sounds a little funny, but the truth is that criminals have a code of ethics. And rape, child molestation, serial killer actions are based on gratification, sexual gratification, all these psychological things that really insult a convict. Because a convict's there to do a job. If he's robbing a bank and someone grabs his gun, he shoots the person the way they think is business is business. Now, a guy that I know told me one time, and he was giving me an example. This is when I first came to jail, and he told me, Bill, listen, if I'm doing a robbery with three guys, and one guy grabs my gun, who's a victim, and I shoot him, that's business. That's a terrible thing, but it's business. But what if my partner comes up to me and tells me, listen, man, hold my gun. I'm going to rape this woman. I'm pulling my gun. I'm shooting him in the head. I don't care if he's my partner now. He just turned my God on his crime into a perversion. So that's how convicts feel about serial killers, rapists, and child molesters. They are to be exterminated at all costs. Tell me a little bit. That was great insight there. Um, You know, me as a detective, as an investigator, as a criminologist, I want to learn as much as I can about the elements of murder and try to hone that craft so I can prevent it or stop it in the future. So when I study Richard Ramirez and I look at his crimes... This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. And I see that he kills indiscriminately, meaning older couples, male, female, young couples. He even molested children. And so for me as an investigator, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around that because he's not given me an M.O., He's not giving me an organized killer at at one scene, but he gives me a disorganized at another scene, and I can't grasp it. And that's why I think, at least in the detective world, he's not held in high regard by no means, but I mean he is looked upon as like an abnormal. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. He is a serial killer who mixes motives, his victims, his gender, his age, his sexuality. What he does have, which is what gratifies him, and you look at his crime and you say, well, it's obviously sex-driven. What is sex-driven for him, and, and, and please bear with me on this, for him, the gratification is control. It's a psychological gratification, and what he has done that another serial killer in California did as well, which was the Golden State Killer, was he sexualized control. That he was able to control his victims so thoroughly was his gratification, and he was able, in his mind, he was able to sexualize it. And once he did that, it didn't matter really what the victim was or who the victim was. That's why you have male, you have female, you have young, you have Asian, you have white, you have Mexican, you have any gender, he's one of those guys that killed, sometimes he was organized, sometimes he was disorganized, sometimes it was by chance, sometimes it was planned. He didn't have an animal, and you're absolutely correct on what you said. He is a different animal. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Nonetheless, he is a serial killer, and he was very prolific. The one thing that also stands out is how quickly he accelerated. You have serial killers who will kill, take a break. Uh, some law enforcement call it that they uh, they go dormant for a while. This guy, as he killed, he just began to accelerate because it, it was an adrenaline rush. It was the control. It was everything. It was the media as well. The media fed this guy's ego. It fed his own uh, narcissistic uh viewpoint of himself and he just felt he had to feed it more and more and more yeah and i i think that's like you said because he didn't have an mo it's what intrigued at least me as an investigator to say and the things that he did inside those homes you know pushing out the eyeballs of some of the victims and just the way he killed i always and i know there's probably others out there uh bittner i believe that you know of that are 
more vicious and sadistic than Richard Ramirez. But on the surface, Richard Ramirez, to me, is one of the most evil people that I've ever come across. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. And, and look, this guy had a persona he loved. The media had him as a, was a rock star. He had, he'd get hundreds of pieces of mail. Actually, they had, the, when the tear officer would come on a tear to hand out everyone's mail, you know, usually get a couple letters. They had to stop passing out mail to bring what's basically a duffel bag full of mail for this guy. This guy was getting fan mail like he was the freaking Angus Young from ACBC. <laughs> it's just incredible the misdiagnosis, the misinterpretation of who this guy was. And it was mostly by young, good looking women who were enthralled by the media really invention of who Richard Ramirez was. And it was an absolute lie. The guy was a pervert. He was a creep, a child molester. He is what any woman would think the most repulsive individual that he was. He was also, his hygiene was horrible. I mean, he didn't shower for weeks on end. He didn't comb his hair. He just was a very uh, unkept individual. Well, speaking of that, because that's what, you know, the insiders, you know, my audience, my fans, they like to know that stuff. So I was just going to ask you, and as a perfect segue to it, is do you have any, like, inside stories uh, between any interactions between you and him or him and somebody else that you can share? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, this is, this is what I do, Ken, and you know, watching people is what I do, and I watched him for for a number of years and actually it was closer to two decades because he lived very close to me and what he was known for on death row and look I, I mentioned criminals convicts and inmates there are a lot of inmates on death row there are a few convicts and the inmates were interact with him one of the things that he was known about and he had a partner in crime and his partner was Lawrence Bitteker, who was known as the Toolbox Killer. He had a van called the Murder Mac, and they'd go around killing young girls between the ages of 13 and 18. What this guy and Richard Ramirez did, because they lived right up above from each other, uh, Richard Ramirez lived in, in a particular cell, and Bitteker lived right beneath him. What they did was they were known as the Porn Kings of Death Row. So they had every kind of porn that someone wanted to buy or look at or whatever. So, of course, I'm curious to know what it is that floats this guy's boat, what he's doing. One of my guys that I worked out with was his neighbor, his actual neighbor, and he would occasionally, on my behalf, speak to him and ask him to look at some of the things he had. And of course, once he got in his cell, he showed me. Well, his pornography was everything from child porn to women in bondage and just crazy stuff, you know, stuff of gay uh, origin. But the thing that really stuck out to me was in his personal books, all the eyes were cut out of the women that he had. He drew heads cut off. He put stab wounds in all the, the victims. He slashed throats. He wrote words like slut. You have 60 seconds remaining. Like slut, whore, and different words of description of women and men, too. So this guy was twisted beyond what you can ever imagine. But his thing was very aggressive porn, and he had it and at that time, back then, People on death row could buy whatever they wanted to from any vendor and keep it. Now they cannot. Wow. Uh, okay. You want to give me a call back and we'll finish? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Bye. So go ahead and uh, continue with your thoughts on the uh, bondage and pornography that uh, Richard had. Well, it just shows the whole the control. His, his whole, you, you mentioned before, you really didn't have an ammo. Uh, you know, true and, and, and untrue. He's, he didn't have really uh, a real signature, but he was all mixed. His M.O. basically was a break in the homes in the evening and, and, and 
shoot the male first in the head and then go on to sexually assault the women and then control the situation. So there was a bit of an MO in what he did. Now, when he came to prison, it just shows the same type of mentality. And, and, and I, I've said this many times, serial killers are not created, they're born this way. And people have argued that, well, Richard Ramirez was the perfect candidate to become a serial killer because his uh, uncle was a Vietnam vet. He cut women's heads off in Vietnam. He raped them. He showed Richard Ramirez in the photographs what he did. And then, of course, uh, he shot his wife, meaning his uncle, I believe, I believe his name is Miguel, shot his wife in front of Richard. And, of course, that traumatized him so much that he became a serial killer. Well, I understand that, and I understand where the experts come up with that. But in most cases, people don't respond to that type of violence by becoming a serial perpetrator. Now, they could become violent, they could become drug addicts, they use drugs. But to continue to seek that gratification when you're murdering, 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 and killing on and on, and sexually violating people and children, There's, this guy was just a twisted pervert, and he was born that way. Now, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. On death row, when they call visiting. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. And yes, on death row, they give you contact visits. Uh, I'm sure people are like, what? They do. It's not like a screen like you see on death row in other states. In California, they go to a visiting room where it is a contact visit. So before you go to your visit, they usually call you between 15 and 10, 15 minutes before your visit. You're going to have a visit, prepare yourself for your visit, an escort is coming to get you. Give me a moment. Yep. Okay, hopefully that won't continue too much longer. But so when they do that, they send what's called an escort to come get you. They make you turn around, they cuff you, they open your door, and then they escort you to the visiting room where they uncuff you and release you into the visiting room. Now, that is significant because it shows he does plan things. So what Richard did when they called his name for this particular day, they actually named, and they usually named the escort, who was coming to get you. Like, for example, you know, correctional officer Maines, go get Ramirez for his visit. He heard this. The person he, they called to come get him was a woman. So the woman approaches his cell between 10, 15 minutes before his visit and finds that his cell is dark. She's not thinking anything because she does this so many times, it becomes routine. She opens his tray slot, which is locked. Everybody's getting visits. What's that, Richard? I said everybody's getting visits right now, huh? Well, those are for medical. They start calling medical, and, they're, and they had an emergency count right now. So we're on standby. What's going to go on? Are they going to run yard? They're not going to run yard. I see. So it's a little hectic. So hopefully, you won't talk too much. But she opens his tray slot where it's locked. That's they, they put your trays. They eat death row people eating their cells. They don't go to a chow hall because basically they don't trust these guys to go into a chow hall because they'll kill each other. And I say these guys because I am no longer really on death row. I do live here, but I will be leaving because I've been sentenced to a lower sentence. So to Richard Ramirez, he opens a tray slot, and this guy, at that moment, pushes his, well, his penis through the tray slot and ejaculates on her. Jeez. Of course, she hits the alarm, but he got what he wanted. In his mind, he was able to control the situation and he sexualized it by doing, he masturbated. So of course, they gaffle him up, they grab his ass, they take him to the hole. He walks by myself with a huge grin on his face. This is the kind of guy that Richie Ramirez is. This is the reason that other convicts want to kill him. Well, that kind of leads me to this question for you, Bill, is these serial killers, let's just stick with Richard Ramirez. He's out on the street. He's murdering these people for control, for power, for the gratification that it gives him. And now he comes to prison. How does he squash 
that gratification that he so long desires for that he was getting out in the street how could how does he get that in prison well in a lot of cases they relive what they did with photographs because he's on death row and i've, I've talked about this before i've told people look you said i got a death row and you're thinking because the da said look we're being hard on crime this guy must die what people don't understand is the appeal process takes 20 30 40 years in that time, he has to participate in his own defense. Therefore, he can ask his lawyers, which he has an army of lawyers, to send him every photograph of every victim in the case. And he has a right to see it because he has the right to participate in his defense. Richard Ramirez has photographs of every one of his victims in the crime scenes, bloodied and everything else, with his work on the walls. What he, he wrote Jack the Knife. He wrote all kinds of things. He set eyeballs in, in, in jewelry boxes. He got photographs of that, and he's allowed to have it. So he relives it. When that isn't enough, he pulls off the stunt that he pulled right there by basically sexually assaulting a female guard. So the killing itself, I mean, uh, he doesn't have to go out into the yard and, and shank somebody because he gets no gratification from the actual killing itself right there. It's the control. It's everything that leads up to that. Is that right? That is correct, but he's also a coward. He's not going to go to a yard with a bunch of apex predators who are guys that are in prison who make other prisoners scared. So the yards on death row are very scary. There's a lot of apex predators out there. And it's not the predator that the public or the audience thinks. They're not 50 different Richard Ramirez's or BTKs. No, those guys are vermin. They're scared. They don't leave their cells. They're always in protective custody. The guy that I'm talking about is a guy who is in his environment in prison. He's a tough guy. He's a big guy. He's very strong. He's very aggressive. That's the guy. That's the convict I'm talking about. Richard Ramirez could never go out to these yards and try something because, they, God, they must stop him to death. He's just not that guy. These right. yards are very territorial. Yeah, so, I mean, he's not going to get any gratification he, anyhow if he was to kill somebody out in that yard, is my opinion. Uh, he doesn't get the gratification that way. It's through fear. It's through control. And he's not going to have anybody fear him out there. That, that's correct. And Richard Ramirez is a perfect example of that. And there are places in such protective custody and it's the reason that I got the insight that I got. And I just like watching these guys. And I did speak to Richard Ramirez on a number of occasions. I talked to him. I wanted to get a feel for who he was. And I did so not because I, I, I wanted to be his friend. I wanted to interrogate him. I wanted to know where he came from. But the reason I got so much insight into this because the warden of San Quentin himself and the director of the California Department of Corrections place me on a special yard to become the IDAP worker, the Inmate Disability Assistant Program Director. And I was on those yards providing care for the elderly. It just happens that this yard was a protective custody yard for basically all the serial killers on death row who were in protective custody. That's how I got close to them. That's how I got the information that I have. And that's why I have such a bird's eye view of what these guys do when they're not performing, when they're just being who they are and sharing what they share amongst each other. So when you were with Ramirez talking to him and him being just who he is, Ramirez, what was your impression of him when you were talking to him? Besides, he probably had bad breath. Well, yeah, that... <laughs> Is absolutely correct as well, because his teeth were rotten to hell. Just that he was a very flip guy. He thought that everything was so cool. If he would talk about anything under the sun, he was just... When you talk to this guy, there's always a creepiness about, about, about him. In every sense of the word. His looks, his dirtiness, but his attitude and how he talked, it was just very flippant. It was like no big deal. Everything is cool. I'm here. No worries. Hmm. But of course, a guy like me sees right through that. It's, it's an act. You can tell it's an act. But the guy didn't have a conscience. He didn't care. As I said, he got photographs. He had photographs of all his victims in his home. He had them in albums. He had them next to pornography in the same book. I know because I got a chance to look at what the, one of them. And 
I took notes on everything he wrote. All the eyes were cut out. The women's throats were slashed. There were stab wounds. A lot of uh, of liter uh, literary words like slut, whore, um, and, and things of that sort. Even when it came to men and children. So very disturbing. I mean, sure, you want to scream at the guy, you want to grab the throat, but that would have killed my study of him. So I had to keep myself in check and just learn as much as I can. So at some point, I didn't have the foresight to know that I'd be speaking to you 10 years later, but there was an idea from my head that if I could get this information, give it to the public, possibly solve cold cases, and of course, give a bit of finalization to victims' families or make the public safer because of the information that I have. Well, you said he was uh, assaulted when he first got there. What Did he change after that? Did that? Did you notice a pronounced change in him at all? Well, the change was he, he refused to go outside. He, he was very quiet for a while. He remained... He didn't speak to many people. He didn't. He was a little paranoid too. That's one thing that I didn't mention. Richard Ramirez was very paranoid. If he walked in a tear and you stuck your mirror out to watch him, he immediately slowed down and he walked a wide berth of your cell. He was afraid someone was going to spear him with a spear, which they do in prison. And there's been people killed that way. Guys roll up newspaper extremely tight where it's almost like a tree branch. They stick an eight inch knife at the end of it and they shove it to the bars with such speed and accuracy that it'll puncture someone's lung or kill them. He was afraid of that. So after he was assaulted, he always gave people's cells a wide berth, especially if he saw a mirror come out. And I, perp look, I'm not gonna lie to you. Ah, I purposely did it. He'd come by my side, stick my mirror out, and then I'd shove it in really quickly and wait, and of course, he would slow down and then he would walk a wide berth myself as far as he would, could away from my bars and then kind of almost run by. Hmm. Okay. I was just curious if, if, you know, how behavior changes after an assault. If he learned, hey, I'm not the top dog here. I, I've learned that real quick, so I'm going to have to change my behavior in order to survive. Yeah, that's exactly right. And look, not that I'm, I'm a sadistic guy, but I was at law library one time, and he came in with double escort because they were afraid someone was going to do something to him. And one of the guys next to me, who well, is a convict, he, you know, Richard Mary asked him a question about something when he was in the cell next to him. And these are brick wall, they're like, Channels. You can't see the person next to you, but you can hear them. Mm -hmm. And Richard Ramirez asked the guy if he was done with a particular penal code section. But he sounded kind of scared. And the guy chuckled. And he said, and Richard asked him, why are you laughing? He said, I have good news and I have bad news for you. The good news is you're not paranoid. The bad news is I want to kill you. I mean, that's the type of messing with his mind that people didn't hear because they wanted to mess with him. They didn't like him. So then did he just learn pretty much to stick to himself except for the one partner you said that he hung out you with? You had 60 seconds remaining. Well, he, as I mentioned, he became the... This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. A lot of different inmates would seek him out to look for pornography and they talked to him. But... The apex for the convicts, they have never talked to them. Gang members never talked to them. They wanted to kill them. Wow. Good insight. All right, you want to give a call back? Yes, I will. Okay. All right. Hey, Ken. Okay, so uh, what else can you tell me uh, and tell the audience about uh, old Richard Night Stalker Ramirez? Well, only that there are now a lot of stories once he's passed away that his ghost haunts the cell which he is in, was in, which is the fourth tier uh, cell 110. And for a number of years, that cell remained empty because guys wouldn't go into that cell. They, they said they saw things. I actually interviewed a few people that actually went into that cell and within a very short period of time, they left that cell. They didn't want to be there anymore because they said they saw things, things happened to them and they wanted nothing to do with that cell. 
Um, you know, we know that he, he died. He died of liver malfunction. Um, and look, he's just nothing that people should not admire this guy. I know people are very intrigued by this guy. I hope that what I shared gives you insight to the kind of person he was. He wasn't a good person in any way, shape, or form. He was a an insect, a killer without conscience. There's only worried about one thing, his own gratification. He didn't care about you or anybody else. And the women he wrote, he just used them. And he was not a good guy. Well, it's funny you mention about the cell, because I'm not going to lie to you. Well, listen, number one, I don't particularly believe in ghosts or anything like that. However, I will tell you this, Bill is the other day, two or three days ago, I was doing a video and I brought up the name Richard Ramirez that we were going to talk about him. And when I said his name, and it's captured on my video, a book fell from over and scared the piss out of me. It fell on the floor. And people saw that and commented that, you know, as soon as you said Richard Ramirez's his name, you had a book fall and then your face was priceless. I said, yeah, well, scared me a little bit. Yeah, no, look, I, I'm a lot like you are in that sense that I, I tend not to believe things like that, but I do believe in this, this place is a bad place. I can, you know, I don't think there's a place in the Western Hemisphere that for the past 168 years has had as much trauma, fear, death, torture, murder, executions than St. Quentin Prison. This place is a bad place. There's a lot of fear here. People fear going outside. Some guys spend 20, 30 years in their cells because they're afraid to come out because of the men that walk these halls. So there's a lot of bad energy here. A person with Richard Ramirez's type of obsessive anger, control, just evilness, I can see where you know, possibly some of that residue was left here and this prison just basically enhanced it. This isn't a good place. And look, uh, you know, I've shared this with you. I've actually written a book about this place and the paranormal. And Richard Ramirez is one of those stories. And one of the guys that was in that cell, I interviewed him. And the story he told me was pretty shocking, very uh, uh, scary. And a lot of guards here talk about the same thing. They see things in the tears. They see uh, former inmates walking. They see a lot of weird stuff. And, um, yeah. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. If you mention his name again, if something else falls, maybe you shouldn't <laughs> mention his name. <laughs> yeah, if that happens again, I'll certainly uh, think twice. But... So he Absolutely. he was known to be into devil worshipping. At least that's what the media portrayed. And he held up his hand, you know, at trial or whatever, and said, "Hail Satan!" Did you see any of that of him inside the prison? Yes, and that's one thing I should have brought up that he did have black Bibles, and he did subscribe to different occult magazines. And people said he heard him chanting over there. One of the guys who lived next door to him told me that he would constantly chant. And yeah, you know, what did he, was he really into that? Did he really believe it? I don't know, but he seemed to be living that lifestyle. His cell had pentagrams on it, had, um, you know, things in red paint because we could buy paint for the Holly program. He painted red uh, pentagrams in the cell. He had different writings of a, of a cult teachings and so yeah he absolutely he did that for how a long guy, what can i tell you i mean did he did he the do whole it? time he was here is that right so it stayed with him that whole, even what was he fit in his 50s when he died 60s well I, yeah he was in his 50s i believe when he died yeah he was 2013 when he died i believe and yeah it, it stuck to actually the person who cleaned his cell was a, a block worker that i know and he showed me some of the things that he pulled out of his cell. I was like, well, let me look at that. I looked at it. Of course, I can't keep it because it is personal property of someone else. But I was looking through the stuff, a lot of occult things, a lot of black Bibles, a lot of pictures of, you know, with the, 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 the horned goat with the, the symbols, books on Aleister Crawley, uh, a number of those type of books. Wow. Very good insight. Uh, there's a lot of things there that... Uh that I liked hearing, you know, in regards to uh, doing further research into serial killers. And I, I particularly like the thought that he was scared to go out into the yard because I think of all the fear that he put into 
an entire community, probably entire state of California at one point in time. And for me to think that he had that little bit of the same fear going out into the yard is almost like poetic justice for me. Uh, it is, absolutely. And people tormented him. Convicts took every opportunity to try and scare him or try to make him feel unsure of himself. And because they felt, as you just mentioned, that he terrorized an entire community, an entire state of California. And a lot of these guys here have mothers, sisters, that told them, is that guy there? Oh, he's a horrible person. That sticks to these guys' minds. And look, the truth is that had he gone outside, again, they would have killed him. And he knew it. They made it very clear. Unfortunately, and I say unfortunately because, look, I don't have any, any love for this guy in any way, shape, or form. The guy that went after him with a nine wasn't that experienced and didn't really know what he was doing. He put a hurting on him, but he didn't know what he was doing. Had it been an experienced convict, they would have killed him that day. Wow. All right. Well, anything else you want to relay about Richard before we end this? Well, no, just that um, he is the greatest uh, media invention that I've ever seen. He's nothing like what they portrayed him on the street because he was just a scared guy who was evil. You know, think of Gollum from The Lord of the Rings. That's how I see Richard Ramirez as Gollum. <laughs> well, I don't know who that is because I've never watched that, but I'm sure people in the audience there, they, they'll probably know. <laughs> well, if you look him up, you'll find what Gollum is. He's a little creepy guy who, uh, given a chance and you turn his back on him, he will try and kill you. Okay. All right, I'm going to end it. Oh, one second. Well, there you have it. There's Bill's interpretation of the Night Stalker, and kind of ironic of what I said is that he was a creation of the media in a way, and how he went out to the prison and go to the yard. You're not the, uh, you're not the alpha dog. Nobody's scared of you. You put the whole state of California in fear for your viciousness, and your unpredictability of breaking in homes, getting the nickname, the Night Stalker. Um, song from ACDC, the Night Stalker. I mean, you have all this, and you're reading it, you're reading it. Everybody's in fear. You go to prison expecting the same thing, and they ain't scared of you. And in fact, they tried to kill you. It's, I bet you it was a very humbling experience for old Richard with his stupid sunglasses on at trial. Uh, one of the things, it was great insight by Bill, great. One of the things that really took me back was that he was still s studying uh, the occult and devil worshipping up until he died. I thought that that was probably just a phase if I had to bet, you know, but apparently not. And that he tried to go out into the yard and was beat up and then tried to they tried to kill him uh and how pornography you know ted bundy said that a lot about how pornography fueled that and that's what i was trying to get at with bill with quashing down those those urges you know isn't it isn't it crazy how they can have crime scene photos because of discovery and because of their defense and their and they just relive it over and over again. Probably trade it with the other serial killers. I took some notes here of what I thought was important. Um, how the control and the power was what Richard Ramirez got off on. Great insights by only the person I could tell you. Another inmate there that was housed with the Night Stalker Richard Ramirez. So, hope you enjoyed this edition of Redemption from Death Row. And, uh, you know what? I guess until next time, Mains out. <laughs>